Thank you for joining the X. Looks like we already got a bunch of uh, people in here. A lot of a lot of Compass colleagues. Thank you for joining us this Friday, the last Friday in September. Today we're going to be doing the September facility update, and we've got some Compass people on the call to help me out. Still looking for Shuresh. Once he's on, we will probably get going. I see Shannon already requesting. Let's let's add Shannon as a speaker. And just as a logistical thing, if you'd like to come up on stage, please ask and make sure that you are on your mobile phone. For some reason, Elon hasn't decided to put speaker privileges up on the desktop yet, but so is life. I know Shannon is maybe in transition right now, but hopefully he'll be ready to go in a couple minutes. All good. Just delivering some kids to their brainwashing for the day. Good. Excellent. You love to see it. I didn't know that they were going to Ethereum school, but I'm, I'm glad that you're doing that. That's very, very good of you, Shannon. There's the stickers. I, I have to learn how to use this again, so I got to find all the fun stickers. Yeah, you, you got to find the stickers for sure, for sure. Well, I got to say, Shresh said he was going to hop on. Unless that's Shresh with the number sign, I don't know if that's who that is. Let me click and see this profile. Oh, yeah, that is. All right, cool. Shrest is on. Great. We'll get going in about one whole minute. We'll just see if anyone else is going to hop on here before we start start running here with the uh, September facility update or the roundup, I should say. Uh, just a shout out to Bitcoin. I think it just crossed 66. Let me bring up some pricing here. Yeah, we're a little bit over 66. We're on our way into what people would call October. Hopefully that's exciting. It's been moving up steadily over the last week. And the recent adjustment, the difficulty adjustment was down. So hopefully hash price starts to be a little kinder to miners. Um, Shannon and Terrest, if you guys are ready, why don't we just jump in? What I'd like to do is go ahead and throw you guys the sites and uh, we can kind of go back and forth a little bit if you guys just even want to pass the mic i i can help pass the mic sometimes the mic pass off may not be as smooth as we'd like it but if you guys are ready why don't we go ahead Shrest, if you could can i start with you i i, I think shannon shannon is still um uh, dropping his kids off at quote brainwashing um do you want to start talking about indiana Sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. So you sound great. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so let's kick things off with Indiana. We're obviously looking at Indiana 1 and 2 together over here. So that includes two separate sites. Uh, so this is something like sometimes maybe like our customers are not fully aware of, but like um, Indiana has two different uh, facilities and they're two different structures. So obviously, this means that uh, electrical issues and overheating affect those two structures differently. That's partly the reason why we track the statistics differently. Um, overall, the uptime in that region has been consistent and uh, decent uh, all throughout the month. We've achieved uh, well over like uh, well over ninety five percent in uh, both of the facilities. However, I think the main issue we've been facing over there is in relation to how the facility deals with peak temperatures. Um, we we're going through, uh, we're getting at the end of the summer, uh, but it's still pretty hot over there in that region. And every once in a while when hot days roll out, um, it really affects the second Indiana structure. And uh, there's certain periods in the afternoons and early evenings uh, when we're seeing a little, little bit of overheating at the site, uh, which basically means that uh, this technicians are spending a lot of time just troubleshooting overheating miners, uh, dealing with um, filters, uh, cleaning them out as much as possible, 
and of course like the, fixing containment, containment and trying to do everything they can to improve the airflow in the facility um as far as we understand uh they have been trying a few extra things uh with the way they open the flaps at the facility and uh the way the amount of intake that is happening into the facility so based on our estimations uh we should be seeing a uh, better uptime for our machines uh over the coming month we've already seen some evidence of that this september uh particularly in the second half of september uh, so that's just like positive signs for what's to come. Uh, we suspect with the additional airflow, we should be able to maintain a decent utilization across both our facilities, um, even on hot days, if they do come in October. Does that mean I get Iowa? Yes, sir. So two facilities in Iowa, Iowa two and three currently. Um, we did have previous facilities in Iowa that are uh, no Longer so uh, combined uptime exceeded 95% uh, last month. So Iowa 2 being at 96 and Iowa 3 being at 96.5. So both of them doing great. Uh, with these two facilities, Iowa 2 is slightly smaller capacity. It's only 632 miners. Um, and we see a very high machine utilization. So 98% there. And then in Iowa 3, it's 2,000 or yeah, 2,982 miners, and we're seeing about a 93.7% utilization there. So we talked about it a little bit last month and how we track both. Shannon, uh, for Manitoba. Shannon, I, I think you just dropped out of service. Is that the same for you, Shrest? Can you not? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think nah, I think I lost him a little bit at the end. But I think what he was saying was he explained how the uptime and utilization is calculated last month, and it's all looking positive for IRI. And, and then he handed it over to me. Just just guessing. <laughs> it just sounds like you want the mic, which is absolutely amazing. Um, Shannon, yeah, I, I think you dropped out a little bit there. I, I know you're I think you're on the road in transition. Um, Shrez, do you want to? Yeah, anything else do you, that you maybe want to say about Iowa that maybe Shannon uh, wasn't able to say before he dropped? Yeah, I think uh, I think what's happened with uh, Iowa, I think uh, a lot of people might know it's a new site that, uh, that came up just a few months ago. It's a new partner that we haven't worked with before. So uh, there's a little bit of adjusting happening as well. We've spoken about that in our uh, facility updates that we put out on a weekly basis. So we're just uh, trying to make sure our, their technological systems and our technological systems are communicating really well. Uh, we have really good channels to communicate with each other and raise issues and just making sure like our processes are working in sync with each other. Um, we've had uh, a very positive experience with our partner uh, at the site. Uh, and I think only positive things from here on because we are at this high level of utilization and uptime while still working out the kinks in the process. Um, so I would expect this to improve over time. Sweet. Lovely. Um, Shannon, do you want to try to try to take Manitoba or let's let's see what your service is like? It should be good. Can you guys can you guys hear me now? Yep, yep. It sounds it's great. All good, it's all solid. Sounds Perfect. Great. Don't tell Elon it's that stupid Starlink internet. Like we'll just blame it on him since it's his platform. See if he shows up, say something about it. Um, as far as the next sites go, so Manitoba, uh, obviously we've had these sites for quite a while. They've been, you know, high performing sites for several years. Uh, it's why we expanded so much up there. Uh, you know, Manitoba started without, with just one small site and we've expanded to, you know, a total of nine sites in that area with the same partner. We would have kept expanding except for the moratoriums that were put in place in, uh, Manitoba area. So Manitoba hydro won't provide any new power or any new loads to crypto loads. Uh, that was set for a year and then it got renewed again. So it still stands at this point in time. So we can maintain the ones we have, which are all great relationships and great operations with the utilities and everything else. But there's not any new expansion in this area, um, which is sad because you get great uptime and it's all, you know, renewable energy up there. So it's all coming directly from hydro uh, within these facilities. So, man, we combine all these facilities because it's kind of a bunch of smaller facilities spread out. Um, and there's basically 2,789 miners. Um, at these facilities, we got a 99.1% uptime, currently at a 92% machine utilization. 
a lot of that has to do with the aging hardware. We talked about that previously with miners that are essentially getting, you know, their older S19s or, you know, maybe J pros that are just struggling because they've been running for several years. So having power supply issues, control board issues, fan failures, and just getting those up. So older miners do have a much higher maintenance requirement, which decreases utilization of the site. Um, in general, super excited uh, to continue moving forward the Manitoba facilities. Uh, it's been, you know, a good experience up there all in all. Sweet. Uh, Stress, do you want to hop in and talk about Minnesota? Well, I just wanted to actually uh, touch base on the Manitoba utilization if we, uh, before we move on, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. It's all you, man. Go. Yeah, so I think it's important to like keep the utilization metric for Manitoba in context. Uh, so based on our power contracts at Manitoba, the way it works is the site actually gets a lot of these scenarios where they're required to partially curtail, not fully, uh, but a small portion of the facility needs to curtail load to ensure that the total utilization, power utilization of the facility doesn't ex exceed a certain amount defined by the electrical grid. Otherwise, they'll be charged a very high rate. Uh, so because of this component, oftentimes we're asked to like curtail a small portion of our fleet at Manitoba. And what we've done is we've put a lot of compass machines that curtail on, on behalf of the needs that we get for that facility. And this ensures that all of our customer machines stay online. So even though the utilization may say 92%, but those 92% that are remaining hashing at 99% uptime are actually uh, customer machines. And the remaining five to seven percent that is constantly having to curtail uh, remains as compass hash rate. So it's just like I think it's important to see the metric in context. Yeah, thank you for that context. I think that that's mm -hmm. more more context, more info is always better. Um, and uh, yeah, please feel free to to dive into the next facility. So Minnesota is one of our uh, decently large size facilities that we have like about 3,800 machines. We've been there for a long time. And I think uh, everybody who's been with us for a while, I think would recognize that they've been like a good partner and um, we've been working really well with them for a long time. Uh, I actually think even the temperatures and the environment in Minnesota is well suited uh, for mining. Uh, I think mainly the main side effect over there is like uh, we have a lot of curtailment incidents at the site, but I think despite the amount of curtailments at the site, we had like, for example, we had 12 uh, curtailment incidents at Minnesota uh, this month. Uh, but despite that, I think the technicians have done a really good job of uh, chasing after the st lag, uh, stag, stag straggler machines after every curtailment and made sure they come back online in a timely manner. Uh, so despite, let's say, for example, the 5% downtime that is associated to curtailment just means that there were large four to six hour curtailments on many days. And on each, each on after each curtailment, the technician spent a lot of time catching up to make sure the utilization remained above 95%. Uh, they are currently tracking at 96.18 for September, uh, which is excellent. And uh, Overall, really good. Uh, nothing much to report, and I think that's a good thing. I think that's an absolute great thing. Uh, the next sites that we have, or the next site is Ohio. Uh, Ohio, Shannon, you want to hop in there? Shannon, you're on mute if you're talking. Shannon? Euler? Uh, Shannon, I'm not sure what's going on. Shres, can you hop in for Ohio? Maybe I just put him to sleep. <laughs> Maybe. Right. Uh, okay, so Ohio too. Uh, and this this obviously is a really good side. Compass operates it ourselves. Uh, we have some some of our great staff at Ohio too who do an excellent job keeping this uh, side running. Uh, we've had a 99.2 percent uptime, so we barely. Uh, had an outage at Ohio too, uh, this this month, which was great. The main challenges at Ohio too have been more uh, associated with electrical issues and exhaust fans in relation to how hot the region goes. Uh, the temperatures there haven't cooled down uh, yet. Uh, we we wait for uh, 
Paul to really kick in and temperatures to truly go down uh, for things to be a bit easier over there. But we remain uh, remain pretty uh, we remain in battle over there with with high temperatures, and we also have some small electrical issues in some of our containers uh, because of which we're having to like um, have some some a small portion of the facility offline. Uh, so actually, the utilization isn't actually a reflection of our technicians uh, not bringing the machines online. I think the utilization is just a reflection of how many electrical issues are uh, keeping miners offline. And there's nothing we can do to bring those back online until we have an electrician on site. And um, just for context, uh, these things tend to take a little bit of time. We need to bring an electrician to the facility, get them to provide us a quote get that pro code approved with the site owner and get everything approved, then book in an appointment, then the electrician comes in, he fixes it. Um, I think some people might think that this is, these things could be done really quickly, but uh, in our experience, it takes a little bit of time and we're just going through the grind at Ohio and hopefully we'll have some more positive updates for the next update. Great. and. Just a shout out to uh, Jeff Bryant, who I believe is also here on the space. Great work out in Ohio. I was able to, with some other people at Compass, able to visit Jeff, and it's just a top-notch job out there. So hopefully we will remedy stuff soon. Uh, the next one is Ontario. I wonder if Shannon is back from the ether, if Elon is uh, you know, not censoring him anymore. Shannon, you want to hop in on Ontario? I mouth off one time, and then I get like, can't use the app. <laughs> Um, so Ontario uh, actually had a great month last month. So uptime was 99.8%. So that's wonderful. Uh, machine utilization is about 94%. So Ontario uh, historically has struggled with a bit of heating due to the facility design and the it's one of the, it's the big wall site. So when you guys see the pictures of Ontario, it's just that giant wall um, of miners that requires lifts and all that fun stuff to operate in that environment. So uh, generally the way it's designed causes a little bit of overheating. There was a bunch of rectification done this last winter and spring months in order to try to improve that this summer. Um, but obviously when you're dealing with temperatures, that's also the time of year when you have various curtailments and stuff like that. So that even happens up in Ontario. Um, so dealing with those heat issues, mitigating it, and obviously at the end of the hot months now, uh, we see that much higher uptime and utilization. So that's wonderful. Um, as far as that goes, uh, it's still kind of the same thing as far as the utilization numbers with an aging fleet. So still a lot of clients out there that are running, you know, J pros and, you know, they have upgrade offers would, you know, improve that specifically because they wouldn't have to be worrying about the repairs of these miners. So as miners age, what they've been running for several years, the repairs increase and those aging fleets just need more maintenance. Sweet. Uh, Shres, do you, is there anything that you want to, Add to what Shen was saying about uh, Ontario. Nah, nothing much to add. I think it's overall running running well despite the heat challenges, and I think the, uh, we're working really well with the partner. And I think hopefully once we get into cooler climate, uh, it'll be better off. Fingers crossed. Great. Um, for the last two, Texas. I don't know if you want to divide these up. If you just want to take. Uh, the first Texas facility, and you can leave it for Shannon or Shresh. You can feel free. Uh, Colby looks like he has his hand up. Colby, you wanna you wanna hop in? Actually, sounds like this is urgent. Yeah, what's up, guys? Appreciate the updates. I think it's hugely valuable. Like I just got off the phone with somebody who's in the audience right now, considering picking up a machine at the Minnesota facility, and I think it's hugely valuable to get the uh, additional contacts on these facilities. I thought I would mention uh, a different angle, which is the financial side of facility updates. And one thing that I think we could point out a little bit better um, is the featured offer in Indiana actually has a tax uh, free, there's no sales tax on that featured offering. So that's uh a little bit of a different angle to consider that if you're going to pick up the most efficient equipment like the S21 Pro, we have that featured offer and there's no sales tax on those turnkey units. 
Excellent. And thank you for mentioning that. I think, um, why don't we, when we get into Q&A, if you can hop back on, you can talk about where people can learn more about that that specific offer. Um, Sir, I'm going to throw it back to you. Do you want to dive into Texas? Uh, I feel like I've come back on after after a commercial break. And we're back on, guys. Uh, so, so <laughs> Texas One. Uh, Texas One, I think uh, there's a few things that we should talk about at Texas One. So first things first, uh, just like, as you'd expect, fall weather, a lot of fluctuation on the grid in electrical demand. Uh, Texas One experienced 24 curtailment incidents this month. So when I tell you the statistics, just keep that in mind. So total miners, 7,500, uptime, 90%, machine utilization, 91%. So it's just important to keep in context that basically when a site keeps curtailing repeatedly, Every single time it curtails, a small percentage of miners don't come back online. It's just the nature of these machines. They aren't designed as well as we'd like them to be. And each time they're turned off and turned back on, uh, it means that somebody on at site will have to go and manually troubleshoot a small portion of them. Uh, in some cases, that might be a hard reboot, which is like unplug the machine and replug it in. And in some cases, it might be some additional troubleshooting that may be necessary. So this kind of adds a lot of pressure on the facility if it keeps curtailing over time. They just can't find a decent chunk of time where like the facilities are running consistently enough uh, for them to fix everything. So that's mainly the challenge that Texas One has been facing with all of these curtailments. And, and to make matters worse, uh, they actually had a one of their transformers fail at the site. And um, that specifically affected about 2,000 of our machines. But the partner has been an, an amazing partner. And what they've done for us is they've relocated our machines to a different part of the facility to keep them hashing. And they, they, they did this in record time to the point that a lot of customers who were affected didn't even realize that this happened. Uh, it was excellent. It was a great job, but this also meant that this was additional resources that they invested towards one, de-racking the machines, re-racking them, re, uh, refixing the containment in the new racks that they packed these machines. And this overall sucked a lot of resources uh, from the facility uh, that got invested towards these transformer repairs and uh, these de-racks and re-racks that they performed and not to mention all the curtailments. Overall, this has been the main reason why we are seeing lower utilizations uh, at Texas One. And I am sure there are certain customers out there who are waiting uh, for the Texas One machine to come back online or are there waiting for their uh, facility to return a diagnostic to them. So this kind of gives them a little bit of insight on what's going on over there and the challenges the on-site staff are facing. Uh, it's not that they want our machines offline. If, if it was up to them, they would love for all of our machines to be online, but they're kind of playing this constant game of cat and mouse with the, with the grid. And uh, this is what, what it does to them. Excellent, excellent for all that context rest. I think that sometimes, you know, actually, this is really why we are doing the September facility roundups and the monthly facility roundups is to be able to really dive a little bit deeper. I know, obviously, we put out weekly uh, facility updates for our customers and our clients and our community to kind of understand where each facility is. But everything that you just said, it just builds the context. So we have all the information so, you know, clients can feel uh, supported because, as I'll quote Curtis Harris, no one cares about our miners being online more than us. So, um, Shannon, anything else you want to add there, or do you want to, you want to finish out Texas? Uh, nothing out of that facility. So we'll jump over to Texas Five. So um, Texas Five has over fifteen hundred miners running with a ninety five percent uptime last month and ninety one percent utilization. Uh, so <clears throat> I think uh, Texas Five, if people were uh, hosted there and paying attention, like right after it went online. It struggled with some electrical infrastructure issues. The substation transformer failed. And so that's literally a substation that serves a lot more than just the Bitcoin mining farm. It serves like a community and all that. So in the beginning, uh, it had a kind of a rough start when that transformer failed within the substation. Uh, then it was several months to be able to get this thing back up online running uh, as far as utilities getting the parts. This is also a, a site that's co-located at a wind farm, um, which creates a different set of unique challenges in and of itself. 
Um, but in general, um, the site has been improving over time. So early on, uh, some of the infrastructure that uh, was there, you know, it's a still the still building structures. I believe you guys can see pictures in like our joint press release online and some things like that. Uh, some of the structures just didn't have the, you know, good enough filtration or there were various cracks. Like when you build steel buildings, there's, you know, opportunity for spacing between different sheeting and things like that to uh, create more dust coming into the facility. So all the facilities underwent a large amount of sealing and improving the air intake side and filtration side of it. On top of that, um, because these steel buildings weren't insulated, uh, they went, we went through and actually foam insulated, did a whole bunch of spray foam insulation within these buildings on the side that's next to the sun, actually reducing a lot of the heat and the temperature within the building themselves. So all these modifications that have been done, we've been able to see this site slowly improve as far as uptime and utilization over time. Um, and that's pretty exciting to see those improvements as things go on, especially with a site that started out struggling with larger electrical infrastructure issues that weren't associated with you know, anything anybody had any control over at that point in time. Um, there's always other issues that happen at various sites. And like this one, we did see, you know, firmware updates on various minor models from Bitmain that caused a lot of control boards to fail, had a lot of uh, control board repairs at this site due to the firmware update. This is something that is sadly still fairly common within this industry is that various firmware applications from the manufacturers, uh, have issues and we don't know those issues until the firmware is updated and then the problem persists and then we have to go solve that issue. Uh, kind of like when S21s first came out, uh, all the miners basically overheated if it was, you know, above like, I don't know, 70 degrees Fahrenheit outside. And that was just because firmware wasn't running like it was supposed to. One single chip uh, was reporting a false temperature. And so the miner would then uh, shut itself down thinking it was overheating. Uh, firmware updates, we we're able to correct that issue, and then we stopped seeing this overheating quote-unquote bug that uh, was dealing with early on the S21 Pro. So d different firmware that comes out can always cause issues with these miners, and it's always a bit of a challenge because we have to make sure the firmware is updating in order to make sure the miners are running as efficiently as possible and aren't having other issues. Or if we're troubleshooting, it always requires updating to the most recent firmware. If that most recent firmware has a feature or a bug that's, you know, unknown within that various minor model, then we're going to run into issues and have to deal with that as we go through it. Um, when we look across like the S19 series of miners, right, there's three types of control boards, there's multiple types of hash boards, and six types of power supplies. And you have to have the right combination of control board, firmware, hash board, power supply to make everything work as far as that goes. So it's never the most easy process um, when troubleshooting, especially when you have so many variants of miners uh, in one place. And so when we update firmware, it might affect a subsection of them, but not a different subsection. So we did see that, um, which is part of what drove down some of the machine utilization last month. Uh, but other than that, uh, excited to see the improvements in Texas 5 and keep those moving forward and watch these numbers increase. Excellent, excellent. Thank you for that, uh, Shannon. Now let's just dive into a q a section and i think tatum has something hot off the grill ready to ask what is up guys it's tatum turn up um i wanted to come in to ask uh really anyone who can give a good answer obviously we're coming out of uh what we like to call curtailment season with the hot weather but a couple of years ago, I remember that Texas had that deep freeze, uh, which also uh, resulted in several Texas facilities curtailing. Um, is that something that is to be expected once we get into really cold temperatures in some of our facilities that may have extremes on the other end? Or is that going to be less? Or what should we expect? What should customers expect going into colder months? So generally speaking, it's June, July, August are the high curtailment months, especially in Texas. Like this is when they have their 4CP program happen. Um, sometimes very rarely, and for you guys who don't know, 4CP is four coincidental peaks. It's just the unknown time of the year in which the grid load hits its peaks. So it's the four highest peaks within the year. Generally, those always occur in Texas in June, July, and August. Um, sometimes it'll bleed out into September, uh, and then, you know, very rarely, but occasionally one of those peaks actually shows up in the wintertime. So pretty straightforward. 
when you think about Texas, Texas has a large amount of wind energy that's going at any given time. Um, and on the other side of the wind energy, a whole bunch of consumers of power and then a handful of other you know, power generation assets. So in the summertime, everybody has their air conditioners on 24 seven, they're just running the whole time, or maybe they're off during the day while they're working, they come home, they turn them on. And so you get these peaks in energy consumption from very large you know, populations of people turning on and off you know, various things to heat and cool their houses. So when that happens, we see these loads ramp up. And as those loads ramp up, all the Bitcoin miners participate in some sort of curtailment program uh, as a requirement by the state uh, and uh, ERCOT and various other entities, or you have to just pay some really high power prices. Um, and we essentially ramp down our loads or turn off our loads so that peak doesn't get as high as it could. Uh, when this happens, right, if enough load gets shut off, uh, one, it protects the grid from being overloaded and have to have like rolling blackouts and brownouts like you see in California. Um, but on the other side of that, it also keeps the power price from going as high as it could. If all the loads stood in all the time and all the natural gas peakers and all the backup power had to turn on to serve those loads, the power prices would get really high. So curtailing these loads actually in, in a large enough fashion, it's not just Bitcoin miners that do this, other manufacturing, uh, anybody who has a large load that can be interrupted participates in these programs. So manufacturing plants have been doing this a long time before uh, Bitcoin mining ever existed. Um, so these loads ramp down and that allows the grid to stay in a nice healthy area. Um, and then loads ramp back up when the demand comes back down. So in the winter time, obviously if it gets cold enough, people kicking on heaters and doing those things, generally you see more natural gas consumption from that because most, uh, heating systems and houses are still primarily natural gas. But as more and more stuff is transitioned to electrical heating infrastructure, we see more and more spikes in that. We also see more increase in electrical consumption from electrical cars and every other thing we continue to push that consumes more electricity. So you do see some issues in the wintertime with peaks happening. That event a few years ago in Texas was an unfortunate event of too much reliability on renewable energy. Um, so essentially, you know, then we see this in Texas regularly. Uh, at some points, 80% of their energy is coming from renewable uh, from wind farms and things like that. And if the wind stops blowing, then all the natural gas peakers have to turn on and turn up. We see this throughout the year. And if this happens in the middle of the winter time and you have a whole bunch of natural gas plants that have been offline, generally they're gonna be offline because when wind is being produced and it's pushing into the market and it's you know winter time and there's not a whole lot going on in Texas because they're not using their heaters, it's not that cold, or they're not using AC because it's not that hot, you have all this excess energy and you actually see wind and re other renewables like solar bid negative rates into the market just to stay online and spinning. When that happens, obviously something like natural gas finds it very hard to compete because they have a fuel source they have to pay for it. And so in that particular event, a lot of gas plants had shut off because it wasn't profitable for them to sell power into the market. Uh, the problem is, is a lot of gas turbines have a very large spin up time right? It could be three hours to be able to get that gas turbine turned on and running and producing electricity. So then when you have a whole bunch of wind shut off because the wind stops blowing uh, and then all these natural gas gen sets weren't on, they have to then turn them on. And so there's going to be a gap. This caused a massive amount of problems in Texas several years ago and a lot of outages. And, and then we also found out that there are a lot of those gas peaker plants that just hadn't been used in a very long time, hadn't been maintained. Uh, had some other freezing and weather related issues. So one of the things that's kind of important that Bitcoin miners fall into is like, we are a consistent load that can be there to keep a lot of this stuff on. So generally speaking, these plants will get used instead of shut off because there's always a buyer of power on the other side. That's going to drive to better uptime within these markets from a power uh, utilization standpoint, especially as we continue to push more and more uh, incentives to drive renewable production. Renewable energy is intermittent power source. Shannon, I th oh. think we lost you. Are you back? I'm good. I still, I'm like even on Wi-Fi now. Elon just doesn't <laughs> like I got me. him. Okay, moving <laughs> on up. Maybe it was me. Sorry, sorry. Huh. Yeah. So anyways, it's, it's kind of cool to see that Bitcoin miners actually help uh, like level out the grid. Um, and actually there was a there was a news article the other day about a site in Minnesota that uh, didn't get approved to become a Bitcoin mining farm which is sad and the electrical commission actually stated in the report uh, fighting back to try to have the Bitcoin mining farm be there 
is like this would have levelized our load. We wouldn't have had all these eeks in power price because we have this, you know, guy, this group that's going to just consume power on a consistent basis and they can just shut off. And so it levelizes load in area, which helps improve pricing. It helps improve all kinds of stuff from the utility and grid management aspect, especially when you have more and more renewables coming online. If you have an intermittent power source, you're either going to have batteries to store it, which we don't have today. They're either not good enough or not in abundance um, or just crazy expensive. Um, or you have to have a load sitting there to be able to take it. Um, and that's one of the biggest things where Bitcoin comes in versus a traditional data center. Traditional data centers need power all the time, right? If if Twitter goes down right now because they decide to curtail, no one would be happy with Twitter. Um, so they're not going to do that. Uh, so that's where intermittent loads like manufacturing, Bitcoin mining, actually provide a really good resource to the grid to be able to manage these things. Hope that's a good enough answer for you, Tatum. I uh, might be a little more confused than I started off with, but I appreciate it. Perfect. I won. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Thank you, Shannon. Um, Colby, I, I see you. You've requested to come up on stage. Uh, what's going on? You're on mute, Colby, if you're talking. Wow. Colby, if you're on your desktop, wow. there you go. <laughs> Colby, Bueller. Don't worry, this isn't being recorded and there aren't people listening. All right, Colby, uh, go on mute, please. Uh, Tim, I see you here. Uh, anything to add to our to our conversation? Yeah, hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Um, just want to give a quick update on our brand new site that's about to open up in Nebraska. Tim, I also can't hear you. Make sure if you are on, if you're on desktop, it's not going to work. To I can hear Tim. You're gonna need I can hear Tim. I, I got Tim. I think it might just be you. All right. I you. Wow, I my problem. I'm going on mute eternally. Bye. Yeah, Jerry's the problem. Thanks, everyone. Uh, yeah, I want to give a quick update on our, our brand new site that's going to be opening up in Nebraska here in just a few days. Um, this is much like our model in Ohio, too, where it's a partner facility, but uh, we are staffing the facility with our own compass staff. Uh, it's just one of our goals going forward is to staff as many sites as possible uh, so that we can control uh, the operations better uh, ongoing. Um, this site is a, like I said, uh, getting some weird, okay. Uh, this site is a brand new site, um, purpose-built building. Uh, so it's non-container. So it's a purpose-built building, uh, 15 megawatts total. We're taking up half the site, so seven and a half megawatts. Um, as with any new site, um, things happen uh, with delays. The site's been delayed uh, for a few weeks now due to uh, some substation inspection issues, but all that's being cleared up this week, and we should be uh, still on track to energize on Monday the 30th uh, coming up. So we're really excited about that. Every All the miners are in the racks. They're cabled. Uh, they're ready to go. So as soon as we get that green light on Monday, uh, we'll be turning those on, and um, hopefully a lot of customers will start seeing their miners come back online. Be happy to answer any questions specifically about the site. I, I would add a little bit to that on why it's important as far as staffing goes. So we're one of the few companies that still uh, have a minimum order quantity of one miner, right? There's a lot of places out there, if it's not a megawatt or if it's not, you know, if it's not several hundred or thousand or something like that, you're not going to be able to get a hosting space. And generally speaking, hosting space is going to be, uh, because it's being aggregated into large sums like this, it's going to be more cost effective than what most residential or general commercial power rates are going to be. Um, but do it due to the fact that we we know that we have customers, kind of large quantity of them that just have one miner. And so that one miner is the, the full in investment or the full you know economic machine within their Bitcoin mining space. And so when we look at one machine um, and that being offline is 100% offline versus when you're looking at a large, you know, if you have a, a miner with 8,000 miners, if they have one machine offline, that's a very small percentage of that. And so in order to provide uh, and, and take care of that, you know, 100% asset, we want to make sure that we have enough staff on site. So if a fan goes bad, we can replace it as quickly as possible. If 
you know, there's a curtailment. It doesn't come back online. We can locate the miner, get over there, do hard resets, diagnostics, and get that sucker running again. So we understand that that one miner represents 100%, and we want to make sure that it's staffed to be able to treat that. Uh, a lot of sites that are ag that we aggregate into um, don't have that mentality, and so the staffing isn't as robust, and we want to make sure that we can augment and supplement that and create the best possible service we can for clients. Mining for the plebs. I see you. Um, I'm bad at hand raising for people who have ever dealt with me on this before. So just go. Yeah. Hey, so Shannon, question for you. As we enter October and mining con economics appear to be improving, like hash price is up something to the tune of 33% from the all-time low that we just recently saw in August, as mining conditions improve and people become more interested in having some hash online, whether that's one machine like my friend who's on stage here, Benjamin, um, or a thousand machines, Shannon, can you speak to rack space? And as people are trying to find rack space, is there just a ton available or is it relatively scarce and you're going to want to be online as, as uh mining conditions improve? Um, I guess like availability is a bit of a relative term, right? So as I just mentioned there, if it's someone with like a single miner, then rack space is extremely scarce because there's very few people that are willing to uh, take MOQ of one. Um, if you have thousands of miners, it becomes a different conversation. Um, but even then, it's still limited. It's a finite amount, right? And if you're, you know, if you're not out building your own facilities and you know putting in the, you know, you know potentially multi million dollar capex to build out a Bitcoin mining farm and be able to go negotiate power rates, buy land, do all that fun stuff, you know, put in, you know, run a complex network that's you know has thousands of thousands of endpoints on, you know, as far as that goes, then hosting is probably the best option. Um, and so when you look at hosting capacity across the markets and, you know, whether that's in the U.S. or other countries, um, it's a very competitive market and it does ebb and flow. So sometimes you're going to see, uh, you know, a large amount of miners get moved from one facility into another, and that's going to create a, 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 an opening where there's a bunch of capacity available. Generally, when there's capacity available, it's just like any open market, you know, if there's a whole bunch more supply than there is demand, you're going to see prices go down. On the other side of that, if there's no capacity available, um, you see prices stay high and go up. Uh, so that's one thing that's kind of cool about Bitcoin is you you get to experience this much more free and open market that's very driven by market sentiment and supply and demand. Um, energy currently is a finite resource, right? There's in order to get a facility up, you got to have energy. It's got to be cost effective. You got to have a data center that's going to be able to run these. There's a lot of pieces that go into it. So uh, it's kind of like the same thing with just the hardware supply itself. Well, I've been in Bitcoin mining since 2017. I've been in mining in which there were tens of thousands of miners and probably hundreds of thousands of miners all over the U.S. available. They didn't have, they were available because they didn't have a home to go to. <laughs> so it drove down miner prices um, because of the lack of hosting slots or just facilities that were built, or, uh, you know, there was a whole bunch sold into the market and everybody thought they were going to resell them and it didn't happen. And so you see there's a bunch of miners, miner prices become cheap. On the other side of that, all the miners get bought up, Bitmain ends up six months plus on back orders or pre-orders, and all the miners are racked. Um, then all of a sudden, miner prices go up. Same thing happens with hosting capacity. And it could be situations in which, all the miners are bought up and we're six months out on, you know, from all the manufacturers of getting new miners into the market because they're, you know, already purchased out that far and they're rolling into facilities for giant pub co's or whatever. Um, and all of a sudden there becomes a open amount of hosting space because there's no miners to plug in. So it's very, you know, crazy market dynamics, ebb and flows. I can't say that it, you know, necessarily follows that four year cycle. Um, uh, like we've always had this idea, this four-year cycle with a lot of this stuff as well. And it doesn't always line up with that. Like right now, um, it seems like Bitcoin miner pricing is at a pretty like low spot. Like there's a ton of availability of hardware in the U.S., overseas. The 
you know, time to delivery is fairly low if you're ordering new stuff. Um, but at the same time, sites are at a premium. If you watch the Pubco buys, they're paying the most anybody has ever paid for sites before. So we have a bull run on places to put Bitcoin miners. Um, at the same time, we have a bear market on the hardware. <laughs> That's <laughs> so interesting. It's pretty crazy. That's interesting because there could be a big disconnect where retail clients or people with, you know, less than a thousand machines, let's say, could effectively benefit from the hardware pricing and they don't necessarily need to put the CapEx into the infrastructure or the facility. And, and also worth noting, like most of our offerings are turnkey, basically, where you're going to be online either in a day or two or, you know, more or less a week tops. Yeah, turnkey miners are probably the best solution for most people that are just looking to get a handful because um, it removes a lot of that risk. Uh, you know, there's always risk when you're energizing a new facility. Like Tim mentioned, Nebraska, uh, like there, even though everything looks like everything's going to go right, something could always go wrong. Uh, we saw that with Texas 5, farm came online, substation transformer failed. It's like, okay, now we got to start over. <laughs> At least that's what it feels like. And that's where, where you know, you have, there's a lot of risk when you're um, bringing up facilities on when they're going to go live, when it's going to energize. Whereas for people that are dealing with, you know, smaller and minimum order quantities, you know, being able to remove all that risk by just picking up a miner that's already hashing somewhere is usually the best value there. Um, unless you're super savvy and you can go to the market and, you know, get some, old gen hardware, get it all working, you know, put it in a, a little stranded gas well somewhere, then obviously, you know, that's going to be a fun, crazy adventure for you. Trying to yeah. go Hell sovereign yeah. into coming up here and talking. Yeah, for sure. Hey, Benjamin, do you want to ask a question? Any question? Yeah. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Can you hear Loud me? and clear, my friend, Lima Charlie. Okay, sweet. Uh, so what's up, everybody? My name is Benjamin, and I just started getting into all of this, the world of Bitcoin, and honestly, just the salvation that it is for a lot of the world's problems. And I think that this is super, super cool. So today I'm going to be buying my first Bitcoin miner. Let's go. Um, I'm just, I'm just thankful for what you guys do, and maybe it's fun to see a noob um getting into it like you guys already are but um my question was today is what are you guys looking forward to in the bitcoin world i saw elon talk to uh, naya bukele and that's a big deal um but also just like what are some key benchmarks in just the grand scheme of bitcoin um that you guys are looking forward to and also thank you for having me it's great to have you um I think I'll pass the mic around and maybe everybody can take a shot. Bitcoin is so massive and there are so many components and so many amazing features to look forward to. Maybe like we can just pick pick one. I, I'll pick something maybe associated with mining because uh, that's the space uh, I'm really super interested in. And I'll say one of the things I'm really looking forward to, which I do think is in the very near future, is more cool things for pleb mining. I think this is the future. I think we're going to see more things like bid access. We're going to see more interesting hardware that customers can host at home, which is going to be super efficient. I'm also expecting some uh, heaters, electrical heaters that, that mine BDC and also like heat your room. Uh, I'm probably expecting something, some kind of water heating solution, integrated, things like that. I do really believe that the mining infrastructure will find a way to service the retail customer at home and not just all only rely on this hosting. I think like the market will get bigger and there'll be more variety and there'll be more scope for people to play a part in it in different ways. Uh, maybe I'll throw it over to Kobe. What, what are you excited about? That's strong, Shrash. That's strong. And I'm really excited about pleb mining as well and and uh, people being able to mine, not necessarily at scale, but just have some hash online. Um, heating solutions is really interesting. Open source projects like Bidax or, you know, um, Avalon Nano 3s or whatever, get some hash online. 
Um, I picked up one of those brains, BMM uh, 100, with a mini miner, which runs about one terahash. Interestingly enough, if you take the overall network hash rate, which has been around 650 exahash, and you divide that by the global population of about 8 billion people, that means that there's less than one terahash online for every human being on Earth. So if you're running even just a little mini miner, that's more than your share of hash rate, fun fact. Um, but what I'm excited about is just Bitcoin evolving and becoming a more uh, mature asset class. And I think the people that are getting involved early, um, especially in the mining space, stand to benefit from you know, Bitcoin changing the world. Johnny? I mean, what I'm most excited about, um, <laughs> I mean, like for some of you guys that know, like I left a different career in a different industry to jump into Bitcoin mining kind of head first. And uh, so when I learned about Bitcoin, I've just been all in ever since. All so ever since. that's as, as far as it goes, like um, I'm just excited to watch this industry to continue to mature, watching governments continue to ad adopt it, watching, you know, it become a uh, literally a political stake. So, you know, watching uh, presidential candidates back Bitcoin to gain the support of Bitcoiners and, you know, people within our industry and seeing that it's so important right now that both candidates then have to come out and say positive things about it. Um, you know, it wasn't even relevant last election cycle from that standpoint. It was, you know, an afterthought. Now it is literally a talking point within, you know, the political world. So that's pretty exciting to see, um, you know, something that started out as a piece of paper and a handful of people running this on little tiny computers, talking about it to with zero marketing, zero companies, zero business to grow into this, you know, crazy trillion dollar asset that is globally accessible and to the point that the world's largest government's presidential candidates have to discuss it. Like it's pretty insane with no marketing team, no business, no company, no CEO. Like it just, that's how amazing this is. Uh, Benjamin, I'm going to try to weigh in. Uh, I'm trying to host with my other phone, but I think my iPhone, there's something wrong with the speaker. I've, I'm going to try to figure that out. Uh, it's our dependence on electronics and uh, technology and energy. Um, I, I want to add on to what some of my colleagues have said and say that this is going to be uh, Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining um, is going to just be such a massive part, I think, on the way that we solve energy crises around the world. I love Colby's breakdown of if you take the overall hash rate and you divide it by 8 billion you know, less than one terahash is online per human being. Um, I'd love to point you towards a podcast that I just did and towards the documentary called Dirty Coin. The One of the more impressive things about this documentary, it's a 70-minute documentary, is it talks about all the benefits of Bitcoin without talking about any of the monetary or financial benefits that you can obviously gain from getting into the network, whether you're mining it, uh, whether you're earning it, however you're getting your hands on Bitcoin. And it really talks about the overall benefits that it's providing to communities around the world. And in this documentary, it, it goes, you know, from Africa up, up to Europe, to South America, through Central America, into all over the states of the United States. And it really touches upon the ways that Bitcoin mining is showing up for communities and just bringing value. Um, so I, I would point you towards that. We just put that podcast up. That's on Spotify, Apple, or you know wherever you get podcasts, it's also on YouTube. You can hear Alana talk a little bit about that. Um, and then just from a larger standpoint, one of the things that I'm kind of looking out for is more sovereign uh, adoption. Obviously, we know that El Salvador right now, it's a national currency for that country. I think other countries are going to adopt it. We have Nile now in Argentina. He's pretty bullish on Bitcoin. He's pretty bullish on finding not current fiat solutions to try to figure out how they get away from inflation because we know that printing more money is never going to help. So I think a longer term thing is as Bitcoin becomes uh, uh, really the lifeboat for people, especially globally, who maybe aren't able and fortunate enough to make the euro or the dollar, they're going to just uh, start to look at Bitcoin as, you know, before I go and hustle for the dollar or before I go 
and I hustle for the euro. I'm just going to hustle for the Bitcoin. I'm going to take my local currency and turn it into Bitcoin. I live most of the year in Bogota, Colombia. And about two weeks ago, I gave a talk about that, that Colombians and just Latinos in general, uh, a lot of times they look up and they look towards the North America, they look towards El Norte, and they're like, how do I get my hands on US dollars? That is the thing that's going to help write my family's future. And there's a lot of people now in Latin America, this isn't anything that I'm saying that's groundbreaking, but it's like, instead of going to hustle for the US dollar, and then maybe take the US dollar and one day, you're going to buy Bitcoin. Why not just start to buy Bitcoin now with some of that? Can we allocate some of that energy into Bitcoin now so you can be on the front end of that? So anyways, I may be running this from this account because apparently my iPhone 7 has better speakers than my iPhone 15. So um, I'll pass the mic now. Adding on to, to the global adoption point, I heard... And I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. Andres Antonopoulos, the guy who wrote Mastering Bitcoin, he made a really interesting point that all money has been basically custodied by a person or an entity, whereas for the first time ever with the innovation of digital value transfer, which is Bitcoin, now the AIs can actually custody Bitcoin as well. So you have AIs plugging into APIs, and the future is digital. So take into consideration that also computing power can be backed by this digital value and the likes of artificial intelligence are going to be using Bitcoin. Uh, real quick, because you mentioned Columbia, Jared, um, and Curtis is down there. I'm trying to get him to come up here and talk a little bit, but uh, it's, I don't know when, I don't know where, and I know we haven't announced it, but there will be, at some point, there'll be some meetups in Denver that we'll be putting on. And I forgot the name of that game that I got this giant metal rock for. Um, but we got to make sure that game exists at that first meetup, I've decided. Okay, yes. Uh, we will be announcing that soon. If you're in the Denver area, we have things in motion for a pretty big event this fall. Thank you, Shane, for reminding. Uh, Curtis is actually multi or simulcasting this on LinkedIn. And the way he's doing that is he's going live from his desktop and then sharing that. So unfortunately, Curtis cannot hop up on stage. Um, but we will be sharing more information about that definitely across our socials over the next couple of weeks. There is an event. That's all I'm going to say right now. Um, it's uh, I think the date is we're still trying to pinpoint the date, but we're definitely looking this fall. I, I will say before December. So stay tuned for that. And yes, the game is Tejo. We will have to figure out how to do that. I'm sure everyone in Denver and everyone in the Bitcoin community would love to learn how to play Tejo. We'll probably need to make sure we get sign off from the fire marshal because, you know, global games aren't always <laughs> easily accepted when it comes to the uh, litigious society of America. Um, we've got about two minutes left. I think I'm going to close out now unless there's anything else. I'm sorry for the uh, technical difficulties I had. I feel like I probably cut Shannon off a couple times and Tim definitely off a couple times. I'm really sorry about that. We'll have that fixed for the next facility update. So our, our October facility update will be on Friday, November the 1st. We normally like to, excuse me, yeah, the Friday, November the 1st. We normally like to do the last Friday of the month, but doing it on uh, Friday, November 25th, doesn't really make sense because we're going to miss out on a, on a week of November. So um, a week of October, excuse me. So we will see everyone on Friday, uh, November the 1st for the October facility roundup. And a big thanks to Shresh um, and Shannon for really helping me out today. And especially when my phone apparently dies. Uh, Colby, thank you for coming up on stage. Tim, thank you for the updates. Ben, welcome to Compass Mining. Um, and if I forgot anyone else, please, uh, excuse me. Oh, and Tatum, Tatum for coming up on stage and asking a good question and yeah, moving things forward. Thank you everyone for joining today and we will see you for another, uh, for the October facility roundup on November 1st at 11 a.m. Eastern time.